of the kingdom to us. Thank you, Lord, that you want to empower us, equip us, and give us wisdom, knowledge, and understanding of your word. We bless you. We honor you. We thank you for this session. We thank you, Lord, for the school of ministry. We thank you, Lord, as you school us, train us, and equip us. We'll be ready to be released, commissioned, and assigned in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to deal tonight with the third key of the kingdom. The Apostles' revelation of church structure and the communion of the Apostles. Now, most of us have grown up with some reference to that, but I submit to you that a lot of that reference has been skewed and has been warped by the subnormality because the revelation was not taught or it wasn't properly revealed. So the key that the apostles got, the revelation that Jesus gave the apostles of the church structure and the communion of the apostles. Now remember the second key was the church. The identity of the church. The first key was the identity of Christ and who Christ is, the eternal king. Amen. Not a natural king in the physical, but an eternal king, an eternal church. The third revelation key was church structure and the communion of the apostles. We must dis rediscover and restore biblical truth and the foundation of that revelation that God gave the apostles in terms of church structure, the fellowship and the communion of the apostles. We must also have true understanding of biblical covering and submission. And we'll deal with covering and submission in the next session. I will touch on it occasionally tonight in the notes. But there's a full session for next week devoted to covering and submission. Oh, amen. Because we need to understand that. And then later in the School of Ministry series, we will be doing and unpacking the fivefold ministry graces and stewardships in detail Amen. and how God has restored them over the recent history of the church how God has restored the evangelist the pastor the teacher the prophet and the apostolic grace so that he could have the church ready to walk in the fullness of the saints authority and the saints blessing so it's important that we understand how to unpack all six of those and we will spend six weeks one a week, unpacking it in more depth and detail. And then on the seventh week of that part of the series, probably in the, the third semester, maybe even we might even get to it in the second semester, but I think it's going to be in the third semester, we're going to unpack that. And then on the seventh week, pull it all back together. Mm -hmm. Amen. Same as when we teach on the God, on Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And everybody does such a fantastic job of separating them and dealing with them in their pockets or individually. But very few have a fourth session where they bring it all back together. Mm -hmm. And we leave people with a fragmented picture. And tonight, we need to understand church structure the communion of the apostles and biblical covering and submission. So are you ready? You see, just as there's apostolic revelation or the keys about Christ and the church, Jesus also taught the disciples, he taught the apostles, the revelation or the key of proper church structure or governmental order. Amen? That's why the Bible says do all things decently and in order there's always order to god it's not a mismatch it's not a flip-flop god is an ordered god amen and he wants us to have order there's also valid apostolic structure 
or what I want to call divine architecture. Now we've seen some buildings. Have you noticed some buildings were not designed by an architect? <laughs> some builders weren't built by a master builder. Although they're a building, they don't resemble something that was built by an architect or designed by an architect and built by a master builder. And in church structure, the governmental order of the church, it needs to be designed by an architect and have architectural structure and it needs to be built by the master builder, Jesus Christ. Amen. Without that, it is a building. But in Opera Khan's, we would say it's a chamos. <laughs> Amen? For you folk watching from overseas, that means it's a mess. You see, and God wants us to understand that divine architecture or structure that will bring victory and unity. The two things that structure does brings victory and unity. Without apostolic architecture or divine architecture, it is going to be more difficult to have unity and victory. And if we want the church, and we'll get to that in the fourth uh, uh, key of the mission of the church, if we want the church to succeed in our mission, in our assignment and ultimate triumph that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church, we have got to tap in and fully understand that divine architecture of governance and structure. Amen? Amen. Matthew 16. You see the master builder speaking here. The architect was God. The architect is God. And the master builder is Jesus. So Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18, And I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Amen. So I'm going to make a bold statement tonight. If it is not built on divine architecture by the master builder, the chances are the gates of hell will prevail against it. That's the dichotomy. That is the tension. If it's not built with divine architecture and the master builder, chances are the gates of hell will prevail against it. But when it's built on divine architecture by the master builder, Jesus himself declared the gates of hell will not prevail against what I built. Amen. 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 That is a fundamental principle that I want to lay foundationally tonight. I want to drive that peg in deep. And I know some of you might not like that. But work it out. Why in the Bible did Jesus say what he said? Well, it's very simple. It was necessary to say it. Why did he say it? Because it was necessary. I don't believe Jesus, when he was ministering, I don't believe Jesus waffled. Just read all the red letters in your Bible. You don't see a lot of waffle down there. He spoke in parables, he spoke in principles, and he laid foundational truth from which we, the church, must operate. He didn't mince his words, and he didn't mess with his words. So if Jesus says, when he's talking about revelation and the, you, the rock and you and I will build my church and the very next sentence he what he's saying is what I'm building as the master builder on God's my father's architecture the gates of hell will not prevail against it Amen. we know from let me just talk to one more scripture just real quick to lay a foundation in Matthew 12 we don't have to turn there, but you remember in Matthew 12, and Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them this, Every kingdom that is divided against itself will be brought to nothing, will be brought down to de desolation. And every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. Remember that. Now, again, 
The context of that scripture is slightly different, but the principle is there. A house divided against itself does not have strength. Yes. If the walls are pulling skew, or the roof is exerting sideways pressure on the walls, instead of downward pressure on the walls, I promise you that house is going to topple over. The laws of physics come into being and the sideways force, the minute it's greater than the downward force, it's going over. Jesus said a house divided against itself will fall. Now we know from sheer experience that there's possibly as many different leadership structures as there are congregations. <laughs> Because everybody has built according to their plan. But few have built according to the divine architecture. And I'm not saying necessarily that it's all wrong and it's all going to fall apart. But if we want to underpin the first key that Jesus said was, if you build your house upon the rock, when the wind comes and the storm blows, the house will stand. But if you build your house on the sand, when the same strength of wind, when the same tempest comes, your house will fall. And there's many leadership structures that are built on sand and not rock. In other words, they're not built on the divine architecture of the father and erected by the master builder Jesus now that we need to understand from a practical point of view as much as we need to understand that from a revelatory point of view Jesus was boldly declaring there's a distinction between what he builds will not be prevailed against and what he doesn't build well anything can happen he's making a bold distinction because he's written it in his word many prominent church leaders today are declaring out of their own mouths the church is in a mess have you ever heard that from preachers church sucks just a few days ago, last week or whatever, I had somebody on Facebook when I posted something about the church rising up and standing up. They said, you're totally mistaken. The church is weak and it's useless and it's floppy. Sure. Yeah. Now, I understand why they make that statement. Because they've taken their eyes off the divine architecture of the structure of leadership and they put their eyes on something else which didn't work and they got hurt. Because if you don't get hurt, you stand strong. When you get hurt, you're looking for the excuse. You start to duck and dive. Amen? Amen. And so when we have good leadership and we have good structure, there's no reason to rebel against it. No. There's no reason to want to be an independent spirit, an independent contract. There's no reason not to be amongst the fellowship of the believers as some are. Now, why are they? Because they've grown cold towards faith and confidence in the leadership structure. Why do we leave church? Why do we leave this congregation and go to that congregation? Well, it's simple. We lost faith or confidence in that leadership. Why did you leave your job? Because you lost faith and confidence in that employer. Because if it was so good, you wouldn't move especially as a child of God, you're not moving, you're not running after money, you're not chasing money, you're looking for something, and if that company's providing it, even though there may be some tough times, you'll stay it out, you'll run the course. Structure is so important in the body of Christ. See, many Christians, individuals, and denominations as, the, as a collective, are uttering those words. And the church is not in unity. And there's little collective direction to lead the church from its defeatist position that it looks like right now. A country. One of the, one of the keys of leadership in the natural. When a country goes to war, 
most citizens of that country will get behind the war effort. When the church wake up and realize that we're in a war footing with the devil, we will pull together a lot better than we do now. War, in a sense, unites the citizenry. And when we understand that we're in a spiritual conflict situation against the forces of darkness, the devil, and he's trying to take that ground and we've got to occupy ground and advance the kingdom of God. When we realize we're in that war, we need to make sure that we have some structure and divine architecture of leadership to take us forward to win that battle. The animal kingdom know it. The natural world understands it. But man thinks we're so smart that we don't need it. Amen? Amen. By and large, the majority of the church has adopted postponement theology positions. Yeah. We're waiting for Jesus to come back, Jesus to reign, and everything's going to be okay. That's, that's postponement theology. We don't believe we're ruling and reigning with Him now. We don't believe we have authority over, over the situations and circumstances now. We're hanging on till Jesus comes or we're hanging on till we fly away. One of the songs of the 80s. It won't be long and I'll be gone. Well, you're now 65, 70 years old and you're still here. Hello. Something was wrong with that theology. But you see that postponement theology, waiting for Jesus to come and rescue the church and redeem her. Yet if we read our Bible, we'll biblically understand and know that Christ has already redeemed us. Amen. He's already saved us. He's already set us free. And therefore, He has already empowered us to walk in victory seated currently in heavenly places our identity and in that identity there's a scepter of godly authority it's called the right hand of the father it's not a physical position it's not a locality it's the scepter of the right hand of authority in god and in that authoritative position this structure the last guy that caused chaos in heaven got dismissed and thrown out god doesn't do chaos and confusion God doesn't do rebellion. My Bible, I don't know what your translation says. My Bible says rebellion is like witchcraft. Be careful, church, how you rebel. Because it's witchcraft. Come on. Now we Say want God again. to bless us. We want God to bless us. But we're actively involved yes. in witchcraft. It's called rebellion. Yeah. Attitude yeah. is rebellion. The wrong attitude is rebellion. You see, here lies the present subnormality, and so the church is divided. And because the church is divided, it's losing ground to the spiritual powers, principles, rulers of darkness and the wickedness of this age. And we see the manifestation of that pushback by the devil, that occupation by the devil in some of the social ills and problems we have around the world, some of the social conflicts around the world, racism and, and unrighteous sexuality and, and pornography and starvation and domination of one against the other or over the other. All of those things are simply the subnormality because the church of the Lord Jesus Christ has not raised, stood up, been raised up in their authority in structure and architectural form and led the world. We've been waiting for Jesus to come. He's not going to do what He's already authoritatively given to us to do. Amen. We have delegated authority in Jesus' name. We have His proxy in the name of Jesus. And if we don't understand that proxy, we're going to struggle. And the gates of hell have opportunity to push back against the kingdom of, and the Christians. You see, there's many areas in the world, and we know that there's many areas in the world that are unevangelized, and they haven't yet been evangelized. 
But there's even more population groups around the world that are living outside of the discipline and the righteous stewardship of the Word of God and the sovereignty of the Kingdom of God. Amen. There's only a few population groups that have not been evangelized. So the majority of the world has been evangelized, but they're still living outside of biblical structure and foundation. And the root of that, at the heart of that, is the failure or the lack of the church from providing structural leadership under divine architecture and the master builder. Sure. The apostles of the Lamb and the ascension gift apostles had revelation of his church, his government, and his structure. And all three of those are linked together. All three of those work as one. It's a triune partnership of his church, his government, and the structure. You can't take one away from the other. It's an equilateral triangle. So many times we speak words without a sound appreciation for the spiritual force that they unleash. And the fact that they can often negate the power and authority that God has placed within us. God gave structure and order. Can you say amen? Amen. The minute we speak against that structure and authority, we negate the power of God in our own lives. Because it's called rebellion. And the minute it's called rebellion, it's called witchcraft. Minute we operate in witchcraft, we got trouble. It's as simple as that. Now, there's a, an account that I read of Dr. Robert Schuller. Does everyone know who Dr. Robert Schuller is? He built a ministry in California called the Crystal Cathedral. A big glass structure. Google it. Such a beautiful boy. And one day. Dr. Schuller, who was prominent, people would come from all over the world when they were visiting the United States to go and see the glass cathedral. And one day he was asking Dr. Paul Yogi Chow from South Korea, why is it that when you leave your pulpit to travel around the world and teach and preach, the house is still full? He says, when I leave to go somewhere, people don't come that Sunday. How come? People still come when you're not there. But when I'm not there, the people don't come. Why? And this was Dr. Cho's answer. He said, I don't have a church. It's his church. Amen. This building is yours. And to Dr. Schuller's honor, that day he repented of wanting to own or take credit for what was built. And God filled that house and it continued to stay filled. Because he had a revelation that unless God build the house, you labor in vain. Yes. Amen? You see, the building that God is building is not about size, spectacularism. It's about strength. If you have a house that God's built and the wind comes, it will not fall. But if you build a spectacular big building that God has not built or is built on the sand, when the winds come, it'll just be spectacularly demolished. <laughs> Is there any difference? See, Jesus said, I'll build my church. Many 
are building something that's not the church. Many are building their own empires. They call it church. Like I said, it's called a building, but it's not built on divine architecture. It's not built by, built by the master builder. It looks like a building. It walks like a building. It cracks like a building, but it ain't a building because it's an empire. You see, many people today talk about we are kingdom me people. But in real fact and essence, they are empire people. Here's the example that we need to understand. If I say to you tonight, I've got measles. And I say, don't come near me because I've got measles. And a few days later, you get this rash and you're feeling off and you go and visit the, your general practitioner, you go visit your doctor and he examines you and he says, oh, by the way, Joe, you've got mumps. And Joe says to the doctor, but that can't be. I was with a guy and he said he had measles. The doctor will tell you what he said was what he wanted you to hear, not what he actually had. Because what you catch is what he's actually got, not what he says he has. If I've got measles, you'll catch measles. If I've got mumps, you'll catch mumps. Even though I might tell you it's the other way around. If you are building an empire, the people with you will catch empire. But if you're building the kingdom Amen. with the divine Amen. architecture and the master builder, they will catch kingdom and not empire. Amen. And I challenge you tonight, folk, to examine in the spirit, are you where God is building kingdom or are you in a place where a man is building empire? I'm not saying move, but I'm asking you the question tonight. Are you prepared to stand up and say, Sir, I love you, brother, but what I'm seeing are the signs of empire and not the signs of kingdom. That takes bravery. But you see what many of us have done in the past, and I'm also guilty of that in the past, we would rather leave and go somewhere else. It's less confrontational. And yet what happens then is that cycle just repeats itself. Instead of somebody in that congregation saying in love, not in judgment, not in condemnation, but in love, I see, please help me, my understanding, what I'm visually seeing, what I'm catching. You're talking about mumps, but I'm getting measles. You're talking about kingdom, but I'm seeing empire. Not godly architecture. Jesus said, I'll give you the keys of the kingdom. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed. You see, we need to understand that there's victory in the structure. There's safety in the structure. Amen? If you ask the folk that are with us in the ministry and dynamic life, if I ask them, do you ever feel unsafe? They will say no. Because one of the things of good leadership is to provide spiritual security. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Spiritual security. Next week, in the next session, when we talk about submission and covering, this will all open up for you. See, Jesus spoke about these revelations, the secrets, the mysteries. But he was giving them much more. He was teaching them, especially the apostles, the stewardship of leadership. Leadership is a stewardship. Amen. Amen. Leadership, Apost the, ap the apostles, the ascension gift apostles, the apostles of the Lamb, were those that God entrusted to take the gospel and lay the foundation for the architecture of the church in the book of Acts. It was a divine architecture. Now if you look in the book of Acts, there's many things that stand out, but one of the prominent things that stand out very early on, as early as Acts chapter 2, Peter and the other apostles were in one accord, and Peter stood up and delivered his message in, 2 P in, in Acts 2, 8, 38. 
But it wasn't just Peter who spoke. All the apostles were in one accord and they stood together with him. They understood leadership structure is about relationship. They understood that it was about unity. They understood the government of being overseers or responsible. See, being an overseer, and I don't want to get into next week's notes, but being an overseer is not to become a dictator. Yes. An overseer is a shepherd and a servant leader. When Jesus said to Peter, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. I want to say to you, he was making a strategic reference to Isaiah 22. He was making a strategic reference to the book of Isaiah chapter 22. Now I'm not going to go through all of that with you, but basically it says this. That Sabina was a steward over the royal household of David. And God says, I'll take that cloak and that robe, that, the vestments, the office of the overseer, and I'll give it to somebody else. What Jesus did was he took the leadership, the role of overseer, away from the Sanhedrin, mm. Come on. took it away, and he put that robe on himself and then he transferred it to the apostles the Sanhedrin the Pharisees had the function of teaching the law Jesus took that and it's, if you read Isaiah 22 you'll see the model there in Isaiah 22 is a type of Christ he was showing that there's a transference, a divine exchange of leadership. <laughs> now because we're in the New Testament and we're in the new church, of the new Zion, the new Jerusalem, the new Israel, that leadership structure doesn't change. God took from the, from the, 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 the Sanhedrin and from the Pharisees, the, etc. He took that leadership upon himself and he transferred some of that leadership in, in, in terms of, 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 of proxy to the apostles. Because he went to heaven, see? And he said, rule until I come. Did he not say that? So there's an authoritative position in stewardship. You have to take authority. In, in other words, you must walk in authority to steward. When a traffic officer walks into the middle of the road and he puts up his hand and a great big semi-truck or a pantechnicum slams on his brakes and comes to a stop, why did they not just run the guy down? Because he stewarded the authority of a bench. If he sat on the side of the road and did nothing, the truck would have passed by. So what changed? He took the badge from the side of the road and positioned the badge in the middle of the road. He just happened to be wearing it. Come on, think about it. That's the authority that God wants to establish in the church. You see, Shabina in, in, in Isaiah 22 was the steward over the household of David, over the royal household. And he prophesied that that office would be transferred. And we need to understand that transference. And you see the problem that a lot of people have, and we'll, we'll really get into this next week, so if you're watching this video series, please tune into the next session because it's so important. Many people that say, I'm under no authority I relate directly to Jesus. God is my covering. I want to lovingly say to you, you've misunderstood the scriptures. You've misinterpreted what God says. Jesus said, and he, again, Isaiah 22 comes out in Matthew 21. 
you read Matthew 21 from about 33, 34 down to the end, exactly the same principle that he established in Isaiah 22 comes out in Matthew 21. Jesus tells of the parable of the vineyard and the vine grower, the transference of authority. God is a God of authority. Can you say amen? amen. Walks with us in authority. See, to the centurion, because you understand authority. Okay. See, we need to learn to understand authority. Now, just for those that are in authority, doesn't give anybody the right to dominate another person. Doesn't give anybody the right to lord it over somebody. Doesn't give the, anybody the right to manipulate anybody. Let's not take that out of context, okay? I'm the authority. No. We are the stewards of God's authority. Amen. The church, the congregation, or the allotment that you shepherd is not your bride. They're his bride. Yes. Yes. Amen? Okay. you got to look after your bride, sir. You go cherish your bride. Don't dominate God's. Amen. You see, I'm not talking about a monarchy of bishops. Timothy says, he who desires an office of a bishop desires a good thing. But then it lays down the qualifications of a bishop. And by the way, just, just so we understand, the word bishop and elder are interchangeable in the Bible. Bishop is not a more senior position, although some denominations have made a bishop more advanced in, in functionality, title, or responsibility than an elder. But in Timothy, the original context of 1 Timothy 3 was a bishop and an elder are the same. But I'm not supporting today a monarchy type of position in the natural. In other words, title or position power. See, the apostles had a function, a stewardship, and a responsibility. They never used apostle as a title. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Not apostle Paul. We refer to it like that because that's the subnormality we've been taught and that's what we've grown up with in that sort of subnormality. It's a function. Now you see, and folk, let me just have a bit of fun with this and please forgive me if I'm having a bit of fun. When you go to the garage and you hand your car in to, the, to be serviced, you don't call, say his name's George. You don't say, Mechanic George. Good morning, Mechanic George. <laughs> Good morning, receptionist so-and-so. Good morning, hairdresser so-and-so. You call them by name. What the hairdresser is what they function in. It's the responsibility that they steward. But now we come to the church and we flip it on its head and we want to put a title in front of it. While we're there, I might as well go there. There's only two titles that God ever put on us. If you want a title... Here they are. Number one, steward. Number two, servant. There's no number three. Amen. That's that. Steward, servant, finished. No apostle, no prophet, no teacher, no evangelist, no mechanic. It's a function of responsibility. Spiritual stewardship, not title. You see, if you're looking for a title, you're building empire around your title. You're building empire around your position. If you're building kingdom, God says, if you want to be great in my kingdom, learn to be a servant of all. One of the most beautiful gifts of serving was Reinhold Bonker. He was a servant. He had a servant's heart. Never got ahead of himself. Never got big-headed and proud. He stayed in a humble servant's heart. And God ministered through him. Billy Graham was a servant. Amen. Billy Graham never wanted a title. But he led millions to the Lord. And he always said, to God be the glory. 
When I, look in the, when I look in the gifts and the move of the Holy Spirit, one of the greatest examples of a servant's heart and a humble heart was Catherine Coleman. Yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, no. oh, yes. When I look at a pastor, one of the greatest pastoral gifts was Mother Teresa. You see, they didn't go after the fame and the title. She desired to be a servant of all. Why do we want to go into titles where the architecture is about serving? And next week we're going to open up and unpack Ephesians 4. The fivefold ministry, grace or giftings are there to serve the body of Christ, not for the body of Christ to serve them. Jesus said, I didn't come to be served, I came to serve. Amen? I challenge you tonight, look at your leader. Are they serving you? Or do they expect you to be there to serve them? If you look at Psalm 122, the decree of David. Now David wrote this, I was glad when they said unto me, let's go up to the house of the Lord. Verse 6 of the same song, pray for the peace of Jerusalem and they shall prosper that love thee. Verse 5, for they are set thrones of judgment and thrones of the house of David. Now here's an interesting thing. When David wrote that song, the temple wasn't built yet. If you look at the, the chronological order, when David said, I am glad that they said, let us go up to the house of the Lord. The house of the Lord wasn't built yet. See, he was prophesying structure into the house. Verse 5. And they will set thrones of judgment and thrones of the house of David. He was talking about a governmental structure that God was going to establish in his house. It's no different in the New Testament. That was a shadow and type of what was to come in the New Testament. David was prophesying by the Spirit about the rulership of the Messiah. And with that comes the rulership or the governance of the church in this current age. And I'm not talking about dominion theology. I'm not just talking about taking dominion and occupying all the places and being in all the government positions as Christians. Though that may possibly be an eventuality as the church rises and the saints of God rise up. But I'm talking about taking spiritual authority and occupying places of spiritual authority over principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, wickedness, and, and, and things of high places. David prophetically, in Psalm 122, David prophetically sees Zion or Jerusalem as a city built and compacted together in a structure. It's built on a covenantal relationship basis. Amen? Mm -hmm. And leadership is covenantal relationship. Leadership is not dictatorship. It's covenantal relationship. The apostles, the communion of the apostles. Was Peter and Paul different? Yeah. Paul and Barnabas had a difference of opinion. But they maintained the fellowship of the apostles. Now that word fellowship in that context didn't mean they just ate together and they were lacquer buddies. It meant they shared the commonality or the centrality of the gospel that they preached. The commonality, the, 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 the similar position of the same gospel that they preached. That was the communion of the apostles. When we break bread, we talk about communion, oneness with Jesus, oneness with his body, oneness with his blood. When the apostles were in communion with each other, there was oneness and unity. When there's proper leadership, there's unity 
his oneness and the gates of hell cannot prevail against the church. The subnormality of empires within what, what has been built to be called the church and the various misalignments of leadership architecture or proper biblical leadership has led to the mess that we have today of a fragmented body. The toe, getting all the toes together and splitting off from the body. And having a toes fellowship. Doesn't work. Amen? Just doesn't, it's not practical. See, why did God, when he was putting, constructing the word, why did he use the, the parables and the metaphors he did so that we could get a, a gain a, an understanding? You wouldn't want all your toes separated from your body. A, they won't function well on their own as toes. And the body doesn't function well without the toes. Amen? We need each other. Prophets. Help me, Jesus. Prophets, stop wanting to group together as a company of prophets outside of the stream of the body of Christ. Amen. Toes get back on the foot. Amen. Fingers get back on the hands. Elbows get back into where you should be placed. There's not an elbows convention. <laughs> Help me, Jesus. But you see, we bring it to the church and we, we just script fancy sayings and words to make it sound spiritual. Meantime, it's just dysfunctional. God doesn't want us to be dysfunctional. He wants us all to function. Now, there are times when the apostles must be together to talk strategy. There's times when the prophets must be together to collectively hear God for a corporate word and a corporate thrust. That, I'm not saying that that shouldn't happen. But every one of those prophets should be connected and interconnected in an allotment in the body of Christ. Every pastor, every evangelist, every teacher, every apostle should be linked and aligned into an allotment within the body of Christ within the locality, within the region, within the geographical sphere, and within the body of Christ globally. Nobody was made by God to be an independent outsider. The organs do not survive outside of the body. And unfortunately, folk, if you've been told, well, that's God's anointing on you to walk alone, that's not true. There may be some alone times. But you were never called to separate from the body and be alone. Amen. Jesus warns against it. You see this authoritarian lording it over people. This subnormality. This misalignment. What happened when people wanted position? That happened even in Jesus' ministry. A couple of brothers ran to mommy. Mommy, will you talk to Jesus? Can you organize with Jesus? You know, he loves you, Mama. You know, if you speak to him, maybe, you know, you'll get better the, further than we are. We don't want to be, we don't want our motives to be seen. So, Mom, will you go talk to Jesus? And will you make, try and get him to make sure that we, in his kingdom we sit at his right hand and his left hand? What did Jesus say to that? Well, when I read it in Matthew 20, he says, it's not mine to give but the Father's. Leadership is raised up and ordained by God. Amen. Not man. We will recognize the gifting and your gifting will make way for you, but man doesn't raise you up. God does. Amen. Amen. Jesus said to them, listen man, don't be like the princes or the, or the Gentiles. They want dominion over one another. And they exercise authority one over the other. Don't let that be named among you. Don't let that be, be who you are. But be a minister. And those that are chief among you, let them be a servant. 
who wants to sit at my right hand and my left hand. You don't know what you're asking. It's not mine to give you. So many people join ministries because they see an opportunity to get into leadership. Yes. They see opportunities to get into prominence. It's not, the, it's not your leaders to give. It's God's to raise up. Amen. In proper divine architecture. James and John's mom tried to manipulate the situation. And Jesus just put that to rest very quickly. Are you with me? See, we've got to understand. Now it was interesting if you look at that passage of scripture in Matthew's gospel. It says in verse 24 of chapter 20, The other disciples, the ten, became indignant, upset, What's the right word? What's another word for indignant? Just upset. Against the two brothers that were trying to manipulate a position. See, there's a lot of people that have become indignant and left the allotment, left the, the, the structure of the body of Christ because they've become indignant with those type of leaders. Old Testament in Jeremiah it says beware to the pastors that have become brutish and tried to lord it over the people. Woe to them the Bible says. Government has a responsibility to lead. Government has a responsibility to steward and to shepherd, not to dominate. We need to learn how to walk in that power that God has given to us. See, so right in the book of Acts, the apostles learned how to commune with one another, founding scriptures. You know one of the things about the book of Acts? As I said, in Acts 2, Peter stood up with the, with the other apostles with him. In, later on in chapter 3, they were daily breaking bread, one accord in fellowship with each other. See, people, when there was good leadership, there was security and they fellowship together. When there's not good leadership, people are fragmented and scattered. God's looking for leadership that will walk in the power of God. Amen? Mm -hmm. So, what was this revelation that the apostles had? To summarize, was they understood there was a divine architecture of God the architect, Jesus the master builder. If you had to sit with Peter on the day of Pentecost, he's in the upper room waiting with all the other disciples because Jesus told him to go and wait. Do you think he knew what he was waiting for? In a, in a, in a, in a, in a definitive way? In a, the, Jesus said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. Go wait. They didn't know what that meant. Truly, or theologically, and they're sitting in the upper room. And the power of the Spirit of God comes and touches them, and they can see cloven tongues like it's fire, and a mighty rushing wind in the whole place. And they're filled, and they begin to speak with other tongues. That's startling enough. Come on. That's exciting. Then he goes outside, and everybody outside starts attacking them and accusing them of being drunk. <laughs> he ain't worked it out himself properly yet, and that's in the natural sense had a revelation of God then he says to them how does he start Peter's message how does he start in Acts 2.38 the same Jesus that you crucified now they're already upset with him and accusing them of being drunk and then he just throws it back at them with absolute boldness hey I'm leaving here listen this Jesus that you crucified has risen. Then the next thing happens that must have astounded him. Because he didn't yet have his leadership certificate. He didn't yet have his ordination document. And thousands came to the Lord. Leadership's not about a piece of paper. 
Leadership's not about a certificate. Leadership's not about man's ordination. Leadership is about flowing in the power of the Holy Spirit and letting God and Christ build His church and the gates of hell will not prevail against Amen. Amen. The rulers, the Pharisees and everybody was there on that day were upset and they were like a picket line and the people pushed through that picket line to get saved and come unto Jesus. And Peter's just leading people to Jesus without a certificate. <laughs> now I'm not saying don't study and don't be approved. Don't take me out of context. But when we lead by the Holy Spirit and let God build what God is building, nobody can stop what God Amen. is doing. Amen. Amen. Trouble is folk too many times. We have too much time on our hands to sit and think about it instead of just acting on it. Peter was in the boat and Jesus said, come. What did he say? Let me think about it. Lord, tell me quickly, what is the viscosity of the water? Lord, how cold is the water? How strong is the current? He didn't think about it. He acted on God's word. And leadership is about acting on the divine architecture. And if we'll get that in our hearts, get that in our spirit, the church today will be overcomers. See, the modern church needs to be under proper biblical oversight of spiritual governance. Not domination or dictatorship or man-made rulership it needs to be under the sovereignty of spiritual governance. Being led by the Spirit of God. Amen? Amen? May God bless you tonight. May God open doors for you. The kingdom of God is a spiritual leadership. Every person has been given authority by God to lead. Let me close by saying this. The structure of church leadership begins in the home. The structure of good leadership begins with a husband who loves his wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Amen. The model is fathers, do not provoke your children to anger and to wrath. That's the first structure of leadership. Leading ourselves well. Leading this household well so that I can steward the grace of God with other people. May God bless you. I, I know this has been deep session tonight. and I've said quite a lot of things that might have stirred you up, rotated your emotions. Praise God. Please tune in for the next session where we're going to talk about biblical submission and proper covering from a biblical context. Father, Thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, that we can lay down all the subnormality, all the misalignment, and rebuild in our lives as you uncover and reveal to us the biblical pattern of the proper godly architecture built through the master builder, Jesus Christ. We bless you. We love you. Amen.